So some of this may be familiar to some of our conversation people, um, which is okay. We're going to see a video you've seen before and things, but I just want to make sure everyone's kind of starting from the same place. So we're going to review just a little bit. All righty. So a lot of what we're doing with this ethics and facilitation is that we're trying to make sure that we're kind of complementing this idea that their narrative and the student voice is important with you know, um, making sure that we're doing it in an ethical, thoughtful way. <coughs> um, so a lot of what we're doing, particularly in some of our intergenerational um, digital stories that we'll be making, is we're really kind of exploring these ideas behind the formation of identity, um, who's our producers and consumers, who are we making these for, making sure our storytellers, and oftentimes in this case it'll be our students that have agency, and being aware of the kind of influence they may have over their audience and the way they're telling these stories. So. As you all know, as teachers, a lot of you English language arts teachers, um, there's been all sorts of evolution to go through storytelling. So, you know, we've started with the origin of the oral narrative, where um, storytelling was very important to pass on information. It was very um, anchored in the present, couldn't move backward. Um, and then we've moved into the written narrative, which is very deliberately, this is point A, B, C, D, and trying to go through um, that, but also the ability to kind of change things around. Once you've taken, had the story, you can't really take it back. But this gives you an idea to you know, um, create this narration in your own way, put it in whatever order you would like, um, and that you can refer back, you can edit, and those kinds of things. So now that we're in with the digital narrative, it's kind of a weird synthesis of these two things because we are still uh, um, kind of incorporating this oral storytelling tradition, but we are also scripting in some ways. Um, do have that ability to make things on linear go back and forth. So trying to um, keep these things in mind that digital narrative, even though it's you know some ways new in this digital storytelling process, um, we're still really calling back on things that we've been doing forever. So this is just our little definition of digital storytelling. It's um, when participants create multimedia projects using you know video production, oral history, podcasts, and data visualization. Create these little shareable tidbits of videos with first person narration and all these different examples, which is what essentially what we're doing with all this audio and visual elements, right? We're hoping to ultimately combine them all together into these digital stories. So here we have an example of a digital story. I apologize to people who've seen this one before. Okay, so it's a little bit different than the one we watched yesterday, right? So let's talk about a few of these differences. What did you like about this one or dislike about this one compared to yesterday? What did you guys think? I like the visual effects, fading <coughs> between a lot more to your inference mm -hmm. a lot of pieces. Go ahead. Um, I like the mixture pictures and video, mm -hmm. and everything felt really appropriate. Like every time you seen it matched what you were talking about, and mm -hmm. I understood why the picture of the video was Other thoughts? So this is just some things. So that one, you know, he was making for himself through Story Center, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but as teachers, you know, you're generally trying to, you know, tie to some sort of standard stuff. I put for this the um, National Education Technology Standards, because I know we've got a few different disciplines in here. So here's there are just a few of the different concepts that you may be able to match up to in your cor in your courses. Um, and then on the next slide, what I have, and these are in your packets, um, are just sample activities that will be tying in some of these kinds of things you might learn. Um, and these are just a few examples. There's a lot of different lesson plans of digital storytelling online. And I'll show you some more resources in a minute. But there's a lot of ways where even if you don't have a full-blown digital story, you can tie in these different elements to your courses. And especially when we get to the point of posting things online and bringing in those skills that um, can be used cross-disciplinarily as well. So these are just some things to keep in mind if you're interested in that. All right, so there's a lot of benefits to digital storytelling. As we just saw, there's a lot of standards that can meet, but this is some of what a lot of researchers in digital storytelling and what, um, what Jessica and I were kind of looking at the original Conversations Project were trying to go for. 
Um, so students will have the opportunity to explore nonlinear timelines. So for those of us who are also working with aging and trying to break some of those conceptions about different ages or trying to kind of um, work on intergenerational relationships, not thinking of, you know, you're born and then you're aging and then you die, but kind of tying in that idea that you can play with time, you can move things around, and you can represent it in a variety of ways. reminds me of Crystal's graphic that we were yes. talking about. <laughs> yes. Yes. Which is funny. Like Jeffrey <laughs> Which was funny because I actually gave her the aging information to read before she made hers, so I thought it was interesting that she included that. But um, So there's also the potential for flexible outcomes and conclusions. So once again, this is all about tinkering, trying and failing. Half of it is just giving them the opportunity to tell their story and also try out all these different new tools you're learning. And it may not come out in this perfect product, but it was about the skills they were learning along the way. So this is also, as you guys learned yesterday as well with making your podcast, there's so much potential for collaboration, working together, really trying to troubleshoot problems in a way that they might not necessarily do in other types of projects when they're working individually or in other types of group projects where maybe they're just um, putting together some sort of presentation that doesn't involve all these different elements that they're having to build. And you know, you might have to take on this part, this part, and then put together this cre creative cohesive whole. So the other great thing about this is there is that potential for being cross-disciplinary. Well, you know, you can make it within your course and rubric. There is all that opportunity with all these different subject areas you can be addressing for. Even when we're discussing things like age at our first meeting conversation, people, we talked about, you know, all those different ways in which the theme of age can kind of transcend whatever exact subject area you're looking at and pull in all these different themes. So what ways that might be able to happen. And there's also the idea of we're helping students encourage their own voices. We're giving them agency in presenting, representing themselves. And while they're still you know, working within the scope of a project or an assignment, they're still learning how to develop their own way of representing themselves. So that's always a really nice way to do it because they can do that not just through the words they're saying, the images they're selecting, the music, the sound effects. It's just the, there's all these different layers they can use. So this is a variety of types of stories. So. Um, this is from the Digital Storytelling, Capturing Lives, Creating Community by Joe Lambert. He helped found Story Center in the 90s. Um, it used to be called, I think, the Center for the Digital Story. Um, and you'll see a lot of references to him and Story Center whenever you do any digital storytelling work, just because they were kind of the founding people who really got into that. So there's the level of no story, which is where they're just kind of presenting information. They're not really kind of creating some sort of narrative arc it's more of just like, here's what I learned, fact, 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 rather than trying to create that narrative. And then there's their story, where they're speaking about a circumstance or a group and telling a story, but it's not about them. They're not part of it. They can't tell it from their perspective. And then there's also the our story, which they were part of the group, but obviously that student can't necessarily speak for the whole of the group. Um, so we're really kind of taking into consideration if they are telling an our story type of narrative that they need to distinguish between, okay, here's what I think, and here's what you know the group may think. You know, you can't necessarily speak for everyone. And then there's the my story, um, which will be, if your students are telling these kinds of stories in, their co in your courses, they may focus a little bit on my story, on me story, because me story is very, very personal. It can open up a lot of things. But my story is they're telling their story, and it is things that happened again, but it's not so much um, necessarily first person, here's all the emotions I felt here. So there's those elements, but it's a little bit more distance, and in some ways, um, I wouldn't say emotionally safer, but if they are sharing to a large group of their peers, it might be a little more sound for them to do that. So, um, and to what Katie said to the Story Center, if you Google it, it comes up right away. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of their own free webinars. Um, Katie and I have taken many of them. Yes. <laughs> I would not suggest them, honestly. No, I wouldn't either. <laughs> So know that, but mm -hmm. also know that it's a really good place to get sample stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can look at that a little bit just to, but yeah, the, web, the thing with the webinars too is they also do paid workshops, so I think they would rather you pay to have them come do the workshop than give it all away in their webinar. So the webinar is just like a sneak peek, so it is valuable in some ways, but. All right, so there's a lot of ethical considerations, and especially since we may be doing these in actual courses that we need to keep in mind when working with our students. Um, for example, if we are getting into, you know, very deep stories about, for example, on the aging topic again, about childhood, about parents' experience, grandparents' experience, they're really sharing things that they may not necessarily realize that they can potentially get into, you know, some very deep emotional things, telling about their family, telling about their life experiences from childhood on, and that you really need to keep in mind that if it's going somewhere that doesn't seem 
you know, okay or the student doesn't seem okay, that we're always making sure that even if we still want them to complete the assignment, but knowing where that line is so that we're not pushing them to tell something that they may not be comfortable with. So there's the other issue of consent and story sharing. Um, ultimately, you know, if students are agreed to the assignment, they consent whatever, but at the same time, there's a difference between consenting to complete the assignment and sharing it with you and also having to share it with, for example, a community gallery or posting it on the internet. So making sure your um, students are comfortable with that because it may be different sharing it with their teacher and their friends than sharing it with the wider community or just posting it for anyone to see on the internet. So just being aware of what comfort level your student has with sharing this information. So also making sure they know that they really own the production and the story itself. Well, for example, like I said, if they're completing for a grade, you need that sort of product. That doesn't necessarily mean you can do whatever you want with it, especially if it has sensitive information in it. So, so if you're doing conversations, we're going to be working with members of the community, too. These things are mm -hmm. really important. So not just with your students, but also with other people. Yes. And we have consent forms and different mm -hmm. things that you'll be able to use yep. when you do your site visits. You keep telling my future things. <laughs> but so with our need for local relevance that's kind of tied in the community and things because we don't really for example this will come up a lot of times they use the example of if you're going into an international community where you don't speak the language or you're not familiar with the way that community works if you come in and are trying to lead a story circle or kind of trying to direct people in the ways they tell the stories that's not really going to work so if you're really going to be a truly ethical leader of storytelling, you need to make sure that you've taken all of those things into consideration, that you know your audience, that you know the people you're working with, and you know um, what their experiences are, so you're not pushing them in directions that, doesn't, that aren't necessarily good for the situation. So also keep in mind that you know ethical engagement is a continual practice. You should continually check in. You should make sure that people are still okay with process after the storytelling, after creating the story itself, um, if they said they wanted to post it online at the beginning and then they may have changed their mind, especially with community members and things that you may not, you may see the one time and then take it back and have the students put those together. Just so making sure they're okay with that whole process because if they do get into it and start revealing different information or things take a different trajectory, you never know if they're still okay with what they agreed to initially. So also with story distribution, generally this is also, I'm sure you guys have forms in your schools and things too, we can't really post student images, voices, anything without their parental consent. So making sure that if you are distributing the things online, not only that you have consent, but that they that consent is maintained, they're still okay with it being online, or if you're sharing it in a community setting, if you're distributing it um, in a way that like it's going to reach tons of people, do they want to frame it some way? Are you giving it to the, to the audience with no context? Because maybe they do feel there is some framing necessary for people to understand and be okay with their story. And we can't really deny them that because, or if they want to like write a little blurb to clarify things, it's not so much like they need to, you know, give the tell the entire story before it happens, but make sure they're aware of how you're going to be sharing this. Yes, Lauren? What if we happen to have a parent, mm -hmm. as we all usually do, who does not want to give their child their consent, mm -hmm. It also depends on what they don't, you know, okay. want to. Because, for example, if they don't want their child's picture online, we won't okay. post the story online. Okay. If they don't want their child's picture taken, okay. they can make a story with other pictures or work in a group or something like that. There's, okay. um, or if they want to make a more abstract, you know, metaphorical kind of story, okay. there are ways. Um, but then, if if they don't want to just do the assignment for the sake of not wanting to make a video, yeah. I'm not sure I can help you there. But there are different ways of, um, if they don't want their child's voice on um, okay. to be in it, you know, there are ways to work around that. We can mask voices. We can have other people talk. Um, so there are stories out there where there's been um, people, they've done um, storytelling projects in where places people might be persecuted religiously or in um, society where women aren't really supposed to be talking in these videos and things where they have you know had other people read um, not revealed the image so there are workarounds like I said if they just don't want to make a video okay. I don't really know about that but there's also about like sorry if you like posted it online or something yeah like well about the storytelling project that with the, the conversations <coughs> right in the future, we're incorporating this into our classrooms. And so it's, it's just kind of part, part of a much bigger um, picture. And so, yeah, with, with their voices being online or their stories being shared with other classes, potentially with other teachers. Right. Um, so I was just trying to think if there's a way where it's not like being published. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Because, because yeah. Right. Yeah. Nothing has 
like it's even for conversations, we're not expecting everything to go online. We know there's sure. gonna be some people not comfortable right. with that. Yeah. So it's really level because even if they just wanted to make a podcast, not videos, you know, there is. But um, because not everyone is going to want to share. And even if you're sharing, you know, but, but you can outline all of that in a consent form. So even if they want to give partial consent, okay. um, there's a lot of different ways we can do that. And if there, if it does come up with a problem, we can meet with you and talk about different ways of working with the project. I you just there's so many different situations and scenarios. Sure. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's more concerned. Yeah, but you just never really know. Yeah. So, but there's so many elements you can adjust and shift and change where the student can participate without revealing that sort of information about themselves. So that's right. the primary concern. Right. Okay. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So um, I think on here, yes, so I just always like to remind people the storyteller has control in the process um, and that this can be emotional weight to storytelling and that a storyteller can revoke their story. Once again, if it's an assignment, the revoking could just be you guys grading it and not sharing it with their peers. It depends on what works for you, but once again, um, for the most part, I feel like in the settings we're going to be telling these um, and the assignments you lay out, they're going to be more general information that they may be a little bit more comfortable sharing, whereas if you were somewhere in a persecuted country giving this information to the press or something, you know, that's a completely different thing than in a controlled classroom environment. But it is just keeping in mind, you know, that some students may just want it to stay in the classroom, um, especially if they do get into these deep stories about their families and things. So here I have an example of the Iris photo with video release form. So this is um, in particular just about whether or not the student can um, participate in a project where their photo or video would be used online. They can take up this thing about being online and their photo and video can be taken, but it's not really um, required that they do publish it. And they can, and we've adapt these depending on the project. So if like, we could add a checkbox where it's like, my photo, but not a video of me, or no, you cannot, but you publish it online, but you can use all the other things. So um, the thing is, is that if the student, which I'm sure most of you experience this with forms in your schools, is that if the student is not 18 or older, they can't consent themselves. So you still need that parental consent form if you're going to post it online. So making sure, and you may, if your school has their own form, you may want to adapt that form as well. This one is particularly taken from language given by SIUE's um, legal department through the university. So that's why we have this particular language. But there, I'm sure your schools have their version of this. So additionally, if your student is out interviewing someone else, and we are going to be publishing it on the internet, you need to have their consent as well. Because if you go in and someone thinks, oh, we're just making a nice story, and then their image and video and voice ends up on the internet, they may not have been okay with that, whereas they may have another. So just making sure you cover your bases. Most people, especially if you've talked to the head and been like, hey, I wanna bring my kids in, and we're gonna do a project, and we're gonna interview you, they're informed, they know, it's just making sure that they know they have those rights and that it is going on the internet potentially or if and you're just sharing it in the classroom. I think it's really important too that they can come back to us anytime that they didn't want it to come down and yes. take it down. So it's not like, oh, it's up, the decision is final. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Things change, we're aware of that and just making sure that everyone involved is comfortable with what's being out, put out there. So, and it's all, like I said down here, it's great if the parents can sign, sign the consent form, but if the student's telling a story and it goes in a different direction they want, they may just not want to post it online, they may just want to share it with you as the teacher, and that's okay, particularly for our people. I know we said we'd love to share the stories online, but we are also aware of all these things. We're not going to make you, oh, you have this many students, you must turn in this many stories. That's not a thing that's going to happen. You can always come to us, even if you've already submitted them to us to put on like the conversation website and we'll take them down. We have no problem with that. So One just another really important detail with community mm -hmm. consent is that they, yes, you'll ask for their consent before the process begins, mm -hmm. but we also need to make sure that they see the finished product and mm -hmm. consent to that going up because yeah. things yeah. change in the yes. process. And you don't want to edit like something that skews how they feel like they're being portrayed. So any questions about consent? And did like you that? say we'll get, you will give us access to like that yes. consent form too? Okay. Yes. Like I said, you may want to talk to your schools first because they may have a particular version they want you to use, but this is just the general one we use. So I'll be sure. That will be up on the website. That's actually currently on the IRIS website if you want access to it, but we'll put, be putting it on the conversation for the Brighter Future website as well. We might change it a little bit specific to conversations. Yes. Yeah, this is just our general one we've thrown for any project um, that we do photo and video for. So, According to Story Center, and once again, Joe Lambert's digital storytelling book, there are about seven steps in the full process 
of creating a digital story. And we'll break that down a little bit more into the actual digital creation part in a second. Um, but this is all about kind of actually doing the story circle. So I'm not going to spend as much on time on this, but ultimately if you don't conduct the interviews or you don't take in the story and figure out what your story is, you're not going to have a digital story to tell anyway, so it is important to touch on this. So some of this may seem a little hokey depending on how you feel about these things, um, but it's all about kind of being in touch with what you want to tell, knowing where it's going to go, how you're going to get the story out so you can pick those images, you can add that narration, you can add all those different elements. One so as you see, <laughs> um, one of the things that I think is important to know that always makes it seem less hokey to me is we talked a little bit about oral histories yesterday. I know some of you have some experience with oral histories. Um, and the thing that makes digital storytelling different than an oral history is that often the oral history has an interviewer and an interviewee. And so in an oral history, you go in and want to know something specific about that person. So Rachel was talking about learning all about um, someone who had experienced balloon events in, in Lynn Carpenter, for example. And it was like, okay, these specific experiences about your youth. I'm going to ask questions and I'm going to draw them out. And that's what an oral history is. Digital storytelling is different because um, the sort of the focus of the practice is the person telling the story themselves. So they have to see themselves in the narrative and they have to understand um, what the end goal of the story is. It's not for someone else to draw them out, but for them to get something through the process of storytelling. Um, so yes, there's an audience, but actually the first person narrator becomes really crucial. They're the center of the story, and it's a way to kind of explore what it means to be your person through narrative. This is who I am, and this is the narrative that I can tell that will share who I am with other people, which is a lot different than oral history, which is like, let me draw you out. This is about a person drawing themselves out. So that covers about steps one through six. <laughs> so we're going to skip a little bit ahead. So, um, well, one through five. So it's all about, you know, what they generally do is they sit in kind of the story center model is they have what they call the story circle and they sit there and they kind of go around. They have a moderator, but he doesn't really ask leading questions. They may have a topic and he just kind of, he or she just kind of moderates in the ways that they're like making sure no one's talking out of turn, everyone's being respectful, making aware that, you know, if we are sharing sensitive information, it stays in this space but really just trying to help people kind of lead their own discussions, communicate with each other in a way that draws out their stories authentically, rather than here is a prompt, here is step one, two, three, these are all the different points, which in some ways, you know, will not always work in a classroom, because a lot of these workshops are just brought to people and they're like, you can tell whatever story you want, which works, but there are still ways within, if they do have a prompt or something, that they can bring out those stories, if, especially if you're not saying, you need to tell me this about your childhood, this about your teenage years, this about, especially if we're talking about aging. So there are ways to do that, but keeping that in mind. Um, so then steps one through five are really about thinking about those things, talking them out, really solidifying the idea of the story and what it means to you before you ever even get to the step of assembling it digitally and really storyboarding, kind of putting it on paper, figuring out what sounds you want to use, figuring out what videos and images. So. There's all these different things that can go into just before you get to the actual creation of the digital aspect of it. Then step seven, sharing your story. You know what that means? Whether you're sharing it online, in the community, in the classroom, is the last step. And sometimes they say you, that even comes after it because if you get feedback or reactions from the sharing stage and you'd like to change your story, they encourage that you can go back and repeat some of these steps. So this is kind of the layout of the story circle. So it's about Clarifying ground rules, protecting the storyteller, making sure people are aware, you know, things should stay in this room, but we can't necessarily guarantee that. Um, focusing the discussion, make sure people are aware of how much time is passing. So even if you're not saying, okay, it's your turn, it's your turn, it's your turn to talk, making sure someone doesn't talk for the entire brainstorming session and being respectful of that. Um, in a way of giving feedback of, you know, in some ways you do need to give feedback, like that's not a topic, that's this or that, which is fine, but, um, Shaping feedback in a way where you're leading them to kind of figure things out and come up with more ideas rather than being like, you know, that's not wrong, or that's wrong, or this is the right answer, because there really is no right or wrong in this. And also making sure that if their peers are giving them feedback, it's constructive and not just trying to be like, oh, I didn't really like your story. So general things that apply to a lot of things, but 
And then try and identify any sort of themes that come out. So if you have everyone brainstorming, doing a story circle type of activity together, seeing what, if you can draw a theme, because a lot of times people will start bringing out ideas and then someone will leave, oh, I relate to that. And this is how I relate to that. And someone's like, oh yeah, and that reminds me of this thing. So maybe trying to tie together what, if they need help finding that central thing, what it was that really pulled that out from them. And then in the end, they say closing summation and encouragement. So really just making sure like, you know, everyone got what they needed out of it. Everyone feels like they're confident and they have a story to tell. And um, making sure once again, that if someone's really dominating the conversation or someone that, you know, we're ending it when it needs to end because we can't, for example, if we have a set time and they can make their digital story, we can't just story circle and talk about it the entire period. So making sure people are aware of that. So this is a graphic I found online um, for a teacher used this in her classroom for the digital storytelling process. So this is a little bit different than Joe Lambert's steps. Um, it's how it worked for her when she was doing an assignment. So you'll see she started with the proposal. They researched any background information if they needed to incorporate that in. Um, so there's the writing the script and storyboard, which I would, in some ways, depending on how it would, I would argue the storyboard would come before the script, um, just because if we're really focusing on visuals and creating those kinds of things, that will change the narration anyway. So um, making sure you gather all the images, video, and audio you'll need, particularly, because once again, um, some of that you won't know until you do lay out what story you're trying to tell and what you do script. And then um, putting it together and sharing is some people just choose to share it in their classroom, some share it other ways. Um, and then a lot of times on other versions of this graphic I've seen, this is common, but there'll be another step that after feedback and reflect, it won't necessarily go straight back to the write a proposal, but it will go back to either the storyboard or gather, create image audios, because there is potential that once they see each other's ideas, they talk about their stories, or they kind of tend to reflect on the kind of feedback they got from their audiences, they may realize that there's elements they would like to try and experience, like, figure out, do new things with. So, just kind of listed a bunch of numbered steps that you guys, do you have questions, comments? Go All right. back one slide. Yeah. Yeah, and I will also put these online because I know it, the toner didn't really do well on some of these, so. Okay, so a little bit difference too is on um, the College of Education, at, I think it's the University of Houston. They have an entire website dedicated to digital storytelling in the classroom. So if you explore there, they've got lesson plans, they've got samples of digital stories they've created, different tools they've found useful all sorts of a variety of things that can be really helpful when trying to less, um, create lesson plans for doing digital storytelling. Where is that again? Um, it's at, it's, if you, the URL down here, oh, except I just blocked it when I went down there, it's digitalstorytelling.coe.uh.edu, and I'll pull that up again on the later slide. Okay. Um, but they've created an entire website dedicated to how you can do, use digital storytelling in the classroom. So this one through seven over here is an older version of kind of the seven steps I showed you a minute ago. Um, it's still the seven steps, but you know, point of view, dramatic question, emotional content, the gift of your voice. And then over here is kind of how teachers have adapted it and how they feel those steps apply. So you'll notice there's a few more, um, and they're a little bit more descriptive. So even before we get to point of view over here, you'll see they have to identify the overall purpose of the story. Why are they doing it? What is it supposed to mean? Kind of that initial question or prompt or assignment you'll have in your course. And then figuring out, you know, who is the narrator? Are they the narrator? Are they telling it from, you know, first person, third person, that kind of thing. Um, figuring out the choice of content, the dramatic questions, making sure they have clarity of voice, pacing, all those different things. Using meaningful audio soundtracks, so making sure students don't, you know, overload it with all sorts of music they want. Um, and making sure they actually have a grasp on the skills in a way like making sure they know if an image is a good quality or not, video, multimedia elements as well, um, making sure the story is um, what it needs to be, so e not even necessarily topically, but making sure they do have the pacing right, that they know that, you know, they have three to four minutes to make this digital storytelling. Did they use that three to four minutes in a productive, constructive way? And then also, of course, want to make sure they use okay grammar and language. So. 
all things that you guys will probably be worried about with these assignments. All right, so here we have um, from, there's a digital storytelling guide for educators from the International Society for Technology and Education. Um, and it's a nice little book, and these are the kinds of things they recommend putting in sort of rubric. So they have three different prongs of the rubric. And it was about the actual creativity and innovation of using and creating the, the materials to create the digital stories, the kind of storytelling they did. And then the production is kind of more assessing the actual skills. Did, how far did they come? Did they really ever get a grasp of it? Those kinds of things. Then actual presentation, which I added a little bit because some of it I disagreed with slightly. Because some of it was a little bit worded a little bit more. Like, um, did they look good? <laughs> and things like that, which I took out because I didn't like that. Um, and I know I don't think they meant it that way, it was just the wording I'd like, no. But, <laughs> so, so I know sometimes you're like, say, dress in business attire, but I think that's different than looking good. So, <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see here, just making sure they understand the assignment, whether or not they're contributing, um, they understand the storyboard development and see in here they even have the first and second draft and the final draft showing that you need to go back and edit as you go along. And then production the, is more of the test things. Did they figure out how to work the software? Did they know how to fix any software issues? And also some of this is more about, you know, they started at point A, where are they now? Rather than, oh, they didn't know, because if they didn't know how to do it, maybe they even learn a few skills that's still a lot of progress. So making sure you keep those things in mind because if you introduce this to a classroom full of students who have never made a podcast, never made a video, that might be different if a few handful of them you know, do that in their free time. So just being conscious of that, it's kind of more about growth than action in some of these situations. Um, and you know, how well do they find it? Do they, for example, if they do pull off a lot of um, information offline for their sound and sound clips and music, being aware that they know they need to cite those kinds of things if they're using more than um, the fair use or they're not using open access and just whether or not they can you know, turn it in on time, edit it, those kinds of things are very straightforward. And then once again, presentation, depending on how you want to put that out there, whether you're doing a community gallery, just presenting to the class, um, making sure that they're aware, they know what's going on, and maybe um, if they do have to write a little bit of information before they introduce their story, those kinds of things. So these are just, like I said, suggestions. They've got the three different prongs. So it can be, if you go all of these, it would be quite a lengthy rubric. But um, they're just, these are just some of the different areas you can explore. And if, you know, for some of our conversation people where we're doing three story time pro projects, if you really want to focus on the creativity on one or how much progress they made in one and three or stuff like that, there are ways you can play with that to track that progress. So those are just a few suggestions. So here are some of the URLs I wanted you guys to have. So Story Center up at the top, um, that's where they've got different categories where it's like, age, relationships, um, all sorts of different thematic topics where you can go and scroll through and see the different stories they have on their website. Um, keep in mind that sometimes they do take them down, which we've kind of talked about. So um, don't always rely, make sure if you know you look a few weeks ahead of time, then you're gonna use it in a lesson, then make sure you check before you use it just because if someone has um, revoked their consent or something, that story will be down. Um, which is actually my initial example that we used um, back in January got taken down, so. Just keeping that in mind. Another thing that I think is really useful of their on their website is they have a kind of bill of rights for a storyteller. Yes. They've got the entire ethics process <coughs> like that. And it's in a doc. that's really useful. Mm -hmm. So that's I mean I think they do ethics well. That's they, what do. they do best. They do. And um because they've got I think the main tabs are like the actual stories themselves and then the ethics, and then they will try to sell you something. But <laughs> <laughs> um but just also it shows if you even look at those screens, what they use, they use a lot of times they'll use like iPads with a microphone and things. So even they if you have their own iPad, software. They have their own software. Um, they also recommend Wii Video, which there used to be a free trial. Um, that ch has changed periodically even since we've started investigating it. But the full version of that does require a paid subscription. So, but the thing is all these elements you can find elsewhere, but you're still seeing how they do their process how they work with the people they work with. Um, there are webinars if you are interested, but they do have a very nice PDF that lays out all the ethical considerations if that's something you're interested mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. That's the storycenter.org mm -hmm. one. Let's just, let's just go there. Might as well, we have time. These ones are all on the resources page. Sure. Yes. So this is the Story Center. So they've got about, and you can explore all the different things there. But like for example, they'll show you their <coughs> 
different listening stations how they've developed their own. Um, and then you can explore all the different initiatives they've had. Like for example, they have, um, they'll go to different countries and explore the different struggles they've faced in um, human rights areas. Um, and then here's the stories tab I was referring to. So if you scroll down, you'll see that they have different themes. So like ours was from family. And then they've also got identity, relationships, community, health, healing, place. So they've got all sorts of different ones. So this might be a very good resource too. Students are just trying to get an idea of the kinds of things. The one thing I will say, there are, um, be aware that there are um, some very heavy topics on here. They're very social justice oriented. So they are very social justice oriented. So um, some of them you may want to pre-screen before you show. Um, not that you guys wouldn't do that, but if you're just sending your students to the website, be aware they may find some stuff that's very dark. And it's good for them to know maybe, but I don't know if parents may agree. <laughs> so. Um, so here you can go if you want to take a workshop, see all the different courses that they offer. So you'll see they'll have like introduction to digital storytelling, the online version, um, a workshop about story scene, um, there's master classes. A lot of these are in person, but they do have quite a few webinars, but you can also pay, like I said, and they'll send a representative, um, which we haven't done, but, cause we, but we have done the webinars. Um, and then there's different... Um, just examples of how they've worked with people. I'm trying to find the our story. I think it might have been under. So here's the story of how they all got started. Where is the ethics? The ethics used to be right easy to find right in front. Maybe there. Maybe I missed it. But anyway, I can also um, look for the ethics. Here we go. Ethical practice. It's on the bottom now. But yeah, so they've got an entire eight-page document dedicated to making sure that all the ethical considerations you may need to consider um, are easy for you to look through, make sure you understand everything. They explain all the different things. They really focus, too, on like when they travel to different countries, what would that entail? So they really are comprehensive in a lot of ways when you need to consider those. Um, so here's the Storyteller Bills, Storyteller's Bill of Rights. So this may be even something if you wanted to print out, share with your students, share with community members, just so they're aware that you know these are the different options available to you. We want you to tell your story, but we also want to do it in a way that's okay with you. <laughs> so yeah, that was just, um, for those of you who are interested, that was, I just was on the main page and scrolled down to the bottom and it was that ethical practice down there. So this other one, I'll just go ahead and show you this as well. Is this is the University of Houston. So if you just type this into Google, sometimes they had an older version from the earlier 2000s that might pop up. It's not active anymore, so make sure you're on the one that looks like this. Um, so they've got all sorts of, they can explain the site here. There's even a history on here somewhere of the old version. Um, and then they've gotten a whole about digital storytelling. So I got my educational uses over here, the seven elements, which we talked about a minute ago, and then all the different skills students might learn different resources they found useful related to digital storytelling. Um, and then they've got an entire tab dedicated to all the different types of stories that they've worked with. And then you can sort it here by category if you're interested in that. Um, and then over here they've got different apps. Um, so Audacity, which some of you are now familiar with. Um, and then you can just scroll through and see the different, so they don't um, necessarily separate out what's free, what's not. So you'll have to be aware of what operating system you're using. Just do a little reading there to make sure that it's, but some of it is open access or free. Um, so because they've also got the web tools. Prezi, I know someone here was telling us about Prezi. And then um, different apps that if they are allowed to have their phones or something and they wanted to try making them if you were on a field trip or something, maybe things that would be useful there. Um, generally, I wouldn't, I think we've discovered we wouldn't recommend necessarily doing video on a phone because it's just not as, um, easy to edit, not as, um, um, it's not as flexible in doing what you want to do. So, but there are some good things for, um, even if just experimenting, playing around um, with videos that are already on the phones and things like that. And they've also got some very nice how-to guides, creating storyboards, those kinds of things. So yeah, this website's very useful. And then over here they've got some different educational materials. So they've got their own rubric as well. So they really have a lot of options for you to explore if you're really interested in that. And then here is just our Iris website. 
Um, if you go to our methods or resources page, so if you just go to Iris, um, methods, here's just some different things. So if you want to do web development, editing, digital storytelling, those things can be found there. And then we also have, if, you, if there's ever something you really want to borrow or come to campus to use, if you're in a pinch, you can always contact us and these are all the different things we offer. Um, and then conversation, you also have that website where if you want to check out equipment, that's available to you as well. So those are just the general resources. And there's plenty more digital storytelling websites out there, people talking about their experiences, how they've used it in their classroom. These are just kind of the hubs where a lot of people have drawn information. And I picked those ones in particular because you also see them referenced in all these other websites a lot of the time. So these are kind of really the two. Story Center is more just kind of the father of digital storytelling, whereas the um, College of Education at the University of Houston is just when they've really started heavily applying it to educational practices. So that's what's going on there. So then, looking to the future, here's just a few ways digital storytelling is starting to go. Some of you may have heard of some of these, like there's been a lot of gamification of storytelling. Some people are even using, I think it's called Minecraft, in like an open mode of Minecraft, letting students create their own stories that way. Um, automated storytelling, where it kind of gives you prompts and you can automatically fill in by giving you ideas. Mobile storytelling, where they may send you an email to your phone or a text saying, you haven't done your story today. What, what are you, what's on your mind today? So there's all these different ways people are experimenting with storytelling. Some have argued about you know, the emotional authenticity of some over others and how much leading really makes it still a digital storytelling. Story. Makes it digital storytelling. But, um, and then there's also, they've been working on softwares that can actually facilitate collaboration a little bit more because in some programs now everyone needs to sit around and log into the same account or around the same computer. So there's a lot of people experiencing with online softwares right now where everyone in the group could possibly be in there working on video at the same time or working on sound, which there are some pros and cons of that. You know, it may be dangerous having a ton of people at the wheel, but they've been just trying out different things. And there's also always the incorporation of social media. People are more and more looking at ways because in a way social media is its own form of storytelling. People are putting forth this version of themselves they want to present, but how they can actually directly draw from their social media posts or accounts and things and incorporate that into other forms of storytelling has become really popular. So I'm just going to leave us with this question. Why digital storytelling? Why would you want to use it in your classroom? Why, how might you see it incorporated? What, what draws or why would you maybe never use digital storytelling in your classroom? Just what do you guys think? I think even though there's, there is a more um, technological aspect mm -hmm. to this than regular narrative writing, mm -hmm. the kids will be more drawn to the video, just, it's what they see. It's what okay. they're doing on YouTube, it's what they're doing on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I feel like it would draw them into it more, more authentic for them than writing it all out. Um, yeah, because there are, there's a little bit different freedom in that way. So, okay. Going off the gamification of storytelling, sorry. Um, I did that once, actually like four years ago when Minecraft was getting really huge, and they um, created basically like Romeo and Juliet, they have an active Romeo and Juliet, and the Minecraft, I guess they're in creative mode because nothing ever happened to their, um, to their castle, but anyway, <laughs> it worked out, it worked out really well, and the thing that I was most not familiar with was um, how they were going to get their Minecraft world into the classroom for us to show. And so if anybody has ideas on that, I mean, I think they ended up bringing them, bringing them in on flash drives because I had two different groups that chose to do it. And, uh, does anybody have any other ideas? Um, one of my, so I teach that for the world literature and one of my, one of their projects is to create their own inferno. Many of them create the inferno of Edwardsville High School. Um, or, you know, like stuff like that. But um, one of my kids actually created, sorry, sorry. Um, one of my students created his own inferno on Minecraft. And with our Poly Vision boards, uh, he was able to put his Xbox up to it and have it displayed on the Poly Vision board so the entire class could see it. And he took us through like the entire inferno that he created in Minecraft and all those little blockhead things that come and attack you at night and like you, you know just like I don't even know Minecraft but it was really awesome. You know now that you mention that I do think one of them hooked up their game console to yeah. the projector board. And I always have kids in my class like at, at least a few that are very tech savvy and so they can figure it out. Um, I have honestly no idea how he connected it because I am not that tech savvy but 
you know, I got a, I usually get a lot of kids that are that do like tech for the theater uh, department, or you know, even they do it for the district in arcade. Mm -hmm. It's their it's their job. Um, so I usually always do not. I, I never have trouble with a student who can figure something out um, or how to connect something to like a polyvision board or whatever. If that's what if you have those in your room, yeah, or access to them. But it was really fun. I mean, just. Um, they I got, got to bring their Xbox to school. They were totally stoked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, not that, they're not that big anymore. Right. No. Yeah. And yeah. It's, well, it's also cool. being um, lesson plans um, online just this summer about incorporating Fortnite into uh, yeah. I'd say <laughs> people big into Fortnite, but I haven't looked too much into that. Well, we were, we were thinking about doing something like educational with Fortnite, but with but we were running into trouble because of the, you know, the, obviously there could be more and more school shootings. And so Fortnite is a very violent game. Um, uh, person and it's a first person active shooter. So that's something that, you know, may well, I kind of wonder how people were working that in. Yeah, because, yeah, and I, because you know, the kids all play it, they love it, they're obsessed with it, they can now play it on their phone. I mean, yes, I do see the value of writing still, but like this gives the audience, uh, I mean, the kids a real audience. You know what I mean? Even if you're just sharing it with your classroom, and you can't do that when you're writing. You know what I mean? Not all the time the kids want their stories read out loud, but if you make it a requirement they had to present it, that, then they mean that gives the kids, um, they want to try harder because they're like, oh my God, but your direction, you want this. So you might get more. Uh, quality of work out of them if you were, if you were just like writing stories. I think of those learners that we all have that don't learn like the typical student. And so like my son, for example, he has dysgraphia, which is like dyslexia, but for language. So he feels really limited whenever he has to write something down or think very linearly. But stuff like this is right up his alley. So he can present what he knows and explore more things in this kind of a format. Um, I was also just thinking about, and you might have to like play with some of the processes, but for a lot of students, they fail to see um, like, the, like the goal of writing. The goal of writing is to communicate a story. And so if you pair that writing with also having them show that in something like this, like. I mean, that's why we write, is to communicate. And this might just be a more accessible way for them to understand that that was the goal in the first place, to so mm -hmm. pair a writing project with something like this and have them tell the same story both ways. Mm -hmm. um, and especially to emphasize, like, we want your writing to express a lot of, like, the same emotion or the same conviction, you know? Um, I think it's a really good way to kind of inspire more interest in the writing process by using this avenue and this already more compelling. Okay. Well, I think this is also embracing the, what I think is the future of public education. Um, because at least in my school, they we, there's a lot of pressure to incorporate technology in the classroom. And you know, with limited resources, that could be difficult to do. But I think our kids are definitely changing a lot. Um, and they're much more digital storytelling in the English classroom specifically or within any humanities courses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to um, you know if anyone wants to come to the STEM Center sometime in a week on prep, you can do you can make a mind prep server for your class for fifty bucks on a Raspberry Pi. Um, the benefit everything that's done in it, so accountability things uh, works a little bit better there. You can have your class in it, set up your own rules, and that sort of thing. So if, if you are really interested in that, um, it should be awesome, probably, you know, because that sounds like something fun I could work out here. And, uh, I'll be there. You know what I'm also thinking? I'm really on to this gamification thing right now. But I had this one really difficult student, and the one thing
anyone had like questions about regarding the storytelling or um or do any of our conversation people want to share the ways they envision incorporating it into their classes or? i can't wait to put this into some of my speech classes okay because i get a lot of students that are intimidated by writing and especially when i'm asking them to write on topics that i'm not super familiar with i think by going a little more digital it actually lets them into their comfort zone so the ones that maybe aren't the greatest speakers, they can rely a little more on the technology, which they're so comfortable using anyway. And I think it's funny that we have such trouble editing all this, and I see my students sit down in a garage band, and they're like, quick, 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 no problem, here you go, that's how you do it. <laughs> so, and that's really great, because it gives yeah. those students that, like I said, aren't traditionally successful in those environments a way to be very successful, and actually okay. kind of show off a little bit. None of our conversation people want to share what they're going to be doing with digital storytelling? I'm pairing it with all of the, the writing examples students have to complete a world literature course. Um, actually, the first unit is, um, is mythology and folklore, and students have to um, essentially tell their own story where they came from because we do cover some creation stories that show how you know, those narratives are all connected no matter where they came from from all around the world. And so students do have to write their own personal narratives okay. discussing where they came from and all of that. And so I think, especially because the first project 